Hi everyone, this video is about some cycles render settings about noise and sampling quality and in particular about direct line and non-progressive render mode and we'll see why it makes sense to restrict to these topics. If you work with cycles you definitely have had some issues with noise but one important thing is knowing where this noise is coming from it doesn't come equally from every aspect of the render not every lamp produces the same amount of noise depending on the size of the lamp generally of course the number of bounces have an influence and so the non-progressive render mode is built to let you specify where do you want to have the processor spend more time so that things that take time will get more attention and the other things can be skipped and then you get a faster render at the same quality. But of course you need to know where the noise is coming from to put the render time in the right place. But you might be wondering why restricting a tutorial for cycles to direct light if one of the key features of cycles is uh, global illumination. Well because this Tweaks for render speed that you have in non-progressive mode work fairly well and reliably relative to direct light. When you start to have more than one bounce, uh, in this case I only have one bounce for glossy, but if you start to have three bounces for both glossy and diffuse, then you'll probably see that there are a number of situations, like I've done some tests in this test scene, and at some point with more than two or three bounces, I would get in the situation where raising the samples in non-progressive mode wasn't getting me anywhere. The noise was still there, while at some point checking progressive and just raising the number of samples would give actually a faster render. I don't know if this is a temporary thing, that as cycles matures, then non-progressive will always be uh, faster if tweaked correctly, or if it's just the nature of things that at some point when you have basically everything going on diffuse, glossy transmission, mesh lights, bounces then it's just simpler to calculate samples equally and let it render with more samples. But let's start with the useful things. So let's start by unchecking progressive and entering this non-progressive render mode. Then we see that instead of having one parameter for the number of samples we have the anti-aliasing samples this generically labeled samples which the important thing about them is that they are the global illumination samples and only affect the noise level of light that is indirect that is uh, from the first bounce not the bounce zero from the lamp to the object and then you get also a samples parameter per each lamp and for the environment. Now these ones on the lamp affect the noise level of the lamp for direct light. Let's start with anti-aliasing. Anti-aliasing is the number of samples per pixel so it affects things like the edges of object if they are jagged and low quality or if they are smooth and well anti-aliasing but it also affects the global quality of your render in a way so you raise anti-aliasing samples if you have thin objects complex silhouettes uh, detailed textures that require more than one sample per pixel to really know what's going on in that point but you can also, you could also uh, raise the anti-aliasing samples to get better overall quality of your image. But it takes time. It's slower than raising the number of samples for that specific object or aspect that is creating noise. So if you're after render uh, spin, always try to increase first the relative samples like for the noise from the shadows from one lamp these samples here 
instead of raising anti-aliasing. And in this test scene, it might seem that there's no difference because the materials are very simple, just like one glossy or one diffuse. And in that case, it's very fast to calculate. But if you add a very complex material with uh, texture per every channel, diffuse, specular and normal, and maybe some blending operations, etc., various uh, BSDFs, then you would get much slower renders by raising the anti-aliasing sample compared to raising the lample samples. So let's say that for the kind of fast render I'm trying to obtain for this scene, you want to start with four anti-aliasing samples. And since we don't have anything particularly small or detailed here, it's enough for this scene. But if you had a more complex thing, then you would go up to eight or 16. More than that, it might be necessary for some situations with some particular uh, lights like the environment light, but that's also the situation where uh, non-progressive starts to be not that convenient. Then after anti-aliasing, before looking at these samples here, let's look at lamps. That's probably the biggest aspect of this thing. So I turned on only this soft big area lamp. Let's set the samples to one. We said that anti-aliasing is going to be fixed to four for this render, for this scene. Render. It's quite fast and quite noisy. Now, as I said, the right thing to do is raise the lamp samples, but let's try with these generic global samples here. Set it to 50 and restrict the area so it takes a bit less. And even if it's taking quite a long time to render this, having raised from 1 to 50 these samples here is not making any difference because what we see here are direct light shadows directly from this lamp to the object. So we can leave this to 1 and you basically can always leave them to 1 except ambient occlusion it's different thing when you're doing direct light only. And let's raise this to 12. And now you see that it's reasonably fast and much smoother because you are calculating way more samples, but only for that specific shadow. And let's do another test to talk about how do you decide how many samples do you need for each lamp? It's strictly related to the size. So if this was a 0.5 lamp and we set the samples to one, we would, sorry, we would still get some noise because any lamp that has size above zero will need more than one sample. But the question you can see is that if the penumbra area and the soft part of the shadow is small, then you need less samples. Actually, you just can get away with less samples and the noise won't be very visible. 
So by contrast, we can look at the other lamp that was in this scene, this spot lamp here. Render only that one. And since it has a size of zero, one sample is quite enough. It's a spot with a blend for the cone, so you can see something that looks like a penumbra area. It's not actually soft shadows. In fact, you can see that under this monkey here, the shadow is perfectly sharp. And these kinds of lamps, any kind of lamp that has a size of zero, is very fast to render. Now, it, you can't see much difference between these two, but in a more complex scene with a lot of lamps, setting the size to zero can really make your render faster. Of course, then these lamps don't look as good as realistic. They are very CG with sharp, sharp shadows, but in some situation, that's, that might be just what you need and you can get away with very fast render then. So you can keep in mind these things when setting up a render. You maybe have two or more lamps, just render and see some noise, but you have to know that maybe this big lamp here needs more samples. The other lamp is fine as it is. You don't need to raise the anti-aliasing or these samples here. Or, and you don't even need to raise samples for this one that has a size of zero. Last type of lamp, the worn emission. And that's going to be a tough one. It's not going to work very well in this case. But I want to show you that is one of the most likely sources of noise. If you have an interior, something where the environment is blocked, but then you have a small opening, then you can turn on sample as lamp and that does wonders for uh, renders where you just have one object and then everything else is the environment then it will clear up uh, and be smooth with much less samples if you have sample as lamp on but if you have an interior not much is going to help not sample as lamp and not even raising the number of samples I have to set it to one or a bit more. I was keeping it off so it wouldn't slow down the other tests. You can see it's very noisy. But the problem is that even if you were to raise this samples significantly, it wouldn't change much, except slowing down the render a lot, but the noise level is not getting much better. And when you start to see situation like this, so if you go from one sample to four or 16, and you see the lamp working okay, then you've solved it. But if you start to raise to 60 or 128 and it's still looking noisy, one option is to try progressive mode and see if that with a certain number of samples is already faster. That might happen. But with world lamp, with the environment emission, It's probably not going to work uh, well anyway. Of course, with thousands of samples, it will in the end work. But basically, uh, this kind of situation with a brute force ray tracing, you should probably either find, find another way. So something like putting an area lamp around here. And I still haven't tried to uh, make a portal lamp in Cycles because in Lux Render, it's the usual way. You have an error lamp that only emits light through this uh, opening, but it shows the color of the sky. And that would be the correct way to get this rendering in any decent amount of time. 
So keep it in mind again, if you render and see noise everywhere, check if it's the worn lamp that is maybe generating 90% of the noise in your scene. Again, it's a problem for an interior if it's an exterior. Instead, word lamp is one of your best allies to have a fast render. Then something about these samples parameters here. As I said, I'm basically doing direct light, so you don't need to increase these samples. One for diffuse is not going to affect anything, but I have 40 for glossy because I also have one bounce of glossy. That's because if you set glossy to zero, you will definitely get a much faster render, but it's going to look very old school CG. Basically, it will look like, just like a specular highlight. And if you have a metallic material that is made with using only one glossy BSDF, and you have zero bounces of glossy, what you get is a black object with some specular highlights. In other scenes, different scene where you maybe have 20 small lamps all around the room, then you would get maybe a much better looking and convincing material already. And then you don't need to raise the glossy. But if you have one or two lamps and a very glossy material, not like this other one here that only has a glossy coating, let's say, with a Fresnel and a base of diffuse, then some glossy. If you only have the glossy, then you probably want to have one bounce of glossy and it will totally change the look of the material. But it will also require a bit more, quite a bit more render time. So, Having explained this, I haven't been working with mesh light much because they are by their own nature expensive and take a lot of time to render. So if you are after speed, you probably not want to use mesh lights. But then I can tell you about ambient occlusion. Not much to say about ambient occlusion. You basically just want to have the product of this anti-aliasing samples and the samples for ambient occlusion to something around 30 to 50. And that will give you a clean pass of ambient occlusion without noise. So if you have to raise your anti-aliasing samples to 8 or 16 because of other reasons, you can lower a bit the ambient occlusion samples. If you have 4, you might need 8 to 12 depending on the radius. The bigger the radius, the more samples it will need to get a correct, uh, smooth looking ambient occlusion pass. And about increasing bounces, there aren't many useful things I can say about this area on this panel, because as soon as you start raising the bounces, there aren't many tricks to raise the bounce number and keep the render time contained. More bounces mean skyrocketing render times, basically. That's part of the nature of cycles. I'm sure there will be development in these areas, of course, but you also have to keep in mind that as it is now, the algorithm, the integrators, uh, path tracing, and it's also probably a, a choice um, of the render engine that many render engines are doing nowadays to not interpolate results. So if you're used to uh, GI in V-Ray, for example, when you give V-Ray a more or less complex scene, you leave the same settings and you basically get the same render time and the scene is done in the sense that you don't see noise. But what changes is that V-Ray will calculate a given number of samples for that scene. I'm simplifying things a lot, but I think it's it's good reference to keep in mind. V-Ray will calculate more or less the same number of samples, but it interpolates, so you get a smooth result with no noise, but with less detail, with less uh, quality, let's say. Cycles and other engines that are 
if not unbiased, because it's not meant to be scientifically accurate and unbiased, but brute force, yes, it is. Other render engines like Cycles, if you give them a more complex scene, then you also need to tell it to calculate more samples. Otherwise, you'll get the same level of detail. You won't lose uh, detail in small areas. It won't be cut away by the interpolation and the blurring that v does heavily. But you'll need more render time, a lot more render time, to clear up the noise. And what you see in here is, well, first that I've raised the number of uh, bounces to two. And from a two minutes render for the direct light only, we've gone up to something like an hour for the render, which seems to happen very often that zero bounces is between one and 10 minutes. Then with one bounce, you go from 10 to 20, 30 minutes, and then you start going to the hours pretty much per every bounce you add. But there's also something very peculiar about this image, a lot of fireflies and fireflies that are evenly spread across the image. It's not the usual situation with fireflies where you have a, like a difficult object, a complex situation, like a glossy object with a ray of strong light uh, at a glancing angle or something like that. And then you get fireflies only on that difficult spot in the render. You're getting even fireflies everywhere. The reason for this kind of pattern is probably this, having minimum bounces uh, lower than maximum bounces. And I guess probably in future versions of cycles, this could be improved with different algorithms for path termination, etc. But right now, if you see this, check this. And for example, in this scene, if I set this to one, minimum one, maximum two, it would render nicely with no fireflies. Sometimes if you set minimum zero and maximum one would already generate a lot of fireflies. And this is something you might want to do because you say, okay, where I don't need, uh, let him determine where it's not needed to have a bounce or two bounce and just cut the ray earlier, but then you risk having a lot of this. So my suggestions would be to use the same max mean number of bounces or try at most to have one or two difference and never have the minimum to zero. Uh, that will generally cause a situation like this one. And also remember that you can, as I was doing before, have maybe one bounce for uh, glossy and zero for diffuse. Or if you can get away with zero bounces of glossy to speed up things, but you want one bounce of uh, diffuse global illumination, you can do the opposite. And if you set max and min to one, there won't be any uh, of this probabilistic path termination that could cause fireflies, but you can still have zero bounces for one of these two, if you want to cut that part away from the render. Last bit of this tutorial, I'll be using this scene as an example because it's a bit more complicated, complex and uh, concrete uh, situation to show how direct light render plus ambient occlusion could be used in practice and how I composite the ambient occlusion over a direct light uh, render. And that's compositing, okay, but it's related to the this tutorial explaining all these things about how to set up fast renders for direct light, then you have to decide, okay, but can I use direct light for finals or uh, I'm supposed to do these settings, use them only for test rendering. And then when I want a decent final image, I'm obligated to then use GI or it won't look anything decent. Uh, of course, it depends on the situation, architectural visualization, uh, the standard is to use GI and have maybe very long rendering, render times, but uh, use the quality of GI because it's 
quick to set up and then slow to render and that fits with architectural visualization. In animation, vice versa, you can take your time to set up things a bit more, but then you have to render many frames, so render times have to be really fast. And so it has always been an option, that of rendering direct light and then working in compositing to try and add the kind of fill light that in reality is GI, proper bounces of light. But in CG, in this case, this area here, this area here, and around here, they are black in the original render. And not just black, they are also noisy. But having here proper light bounces from the other objects, or having just some ambient occlusion that will fill these areas with some light, it's basically the same. And this renders in 10 minutes. And the other one, it's up to you to decide, but would take probably hours to render. So how do I composite this thing? Of course, you can uh, not use composite and just enable ambient occlusion and set the factor. You can see it's enabled here, but with a factor of 0.01. So basically it's not there. It's not really visible in the clean render without compositing, but I have a pass for that. And what I do is I later in compositing add this ambient occlusion pass to my render. And the way I like to composite ambient occlusion is I take the image. In this case, the image is going through a bit of color grading before and then going to this add node, but it basically like your render adding ambient occlusion. And what I do to the ambient occlusion is to add it, but also use the diffuse direct as a color ramp to control how much the ambient occlusion is added to the render. Let's look at this color ramp that is controlling the ambient occlusion uh, mix rate, add rate to the render. And you can see that basically I'm adding the ambient occlusion by a factor of less than 50%, like 25%, where the direct light is completely absent. Where the direct light channel is completely black, then I add a lot of ambient occlusion intensity. Where there is already light, I won't add much ambient occlusion because it's not needed. And in this way, the ambient occlusion acts as a fill light and will only affect the areas that don't have much light going on. Then I also do the classic uh, ambient occlusion effect by using soft light or overlay or multiply, but not too strong. Multiply only darkens, uh, overlay does a bit of both, and soft light is the like softest of the three uh, options to uh, blend the ambient occlusion with the original render. And that's the classic way of doing that, that will mix the ambient occlusion effect in the corners with the original render. But to use the ambient occlusion to fill light, to add light, where the original render is completely pitch black, this add is doing a different thing, is doing this, this work of adding fill light. And as I said, it's using a color ramp so that it added more ambient occlusion where the direct light is completely dark and less where there's already other light going on. But also, I'm not just adding the ambient occlusion as a black and white image, but I'm adding it multiplied by the diffuse color. And that makes sense because it's basically treating this ambient occlusion as any other kind of light. If you want to reconstruct the portion of the image that is uh, created by the diffuse light, you have to multiply diffuse direct by um, diffuse color, same for glossy. And just adding 
ambient occlusion to your render. You can try it and it will wash down the colors, will make everything less saturated and try to tend to go to white. But if you multiply it by the actual diffuse color of the every of the every material in the scene then you get a, a, a better blending between the ambient occlusion and the original render and you can also tint it a bit like i've done here that these shadow areas are a bit bluer than the rest and about the noise that you could see here i haven't done anything to hide it so the noise you see here basically when it gets uh, mixed with the ambient occlusion, the ambient occlusion will just hide it. There is no blur denoise filter going on. It's just this adding the ambient occlusion that will hide the noise, which is also quite a nice bonus of doing things this way. And that's all for this tutorial, because the subject is big, I tried to pick a few useful things and I hope I haven't upset any render theory ray tracing expert because I've now I've been simplifying a few things like how cycles works, how VRA works and that makes sense as a guideline for artists to set up their scenes uh, if you start talking about proper uh, ray tracing and how things really work in code and in the science, the math of it, it's way more complicated and I get it up to a point, up to a low level than um, one really good place to talk about serious uh, ray tracing uh, theory is the uh, Lux Render Forum. People um, around there really know this stuff and what the bounces, the termination and the integrators do exactly and what generates more noise or less noise but I hope I've been able to give you some practical advice to debug your scenes and try to find the best settings so see you next time